Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Američki magazin Time dva puta ga je uvrstio na popis 100 najutjecajnijih osoba na svijetu, dok ga je britanski ekonomist 2011. godine opisao kao jednog od tri najznačajnija svjetska ekonomista prvog desetljeća 21. stoljeća. Gost emisije recite Al Jazeera je Jeffrey Sachs, američki ekonomista i profesor na Univerzitetu Kolumbija, poznat po zalaganju za ujednačeni ekonomski razvoj i suzbijanje siromaštva. All right, Professor Sachs, hello and welcome to the Al Jazeera Balkans channel and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Now, I want to start with something you wrote recently for the Al Jazeera English website. You say that Israel's war on Gaza has become Palestine's liberation war and that the brutality of the war and blatant disregard for international law has shaken global politics to the core. Now, how exactly do you see this becoming Palestine's war of liberation? I think we're very close. <laughs> It seems counterintuitive, but I think right. we are close to Palestine joining the United Nations as a sovereign nation, as the 194th member state. Uh, this almost happened uh, in April, but the United States vetoed it. Uh, the U.S. stood alone. The General Assembly then uh, voted overwhelmingly for Palestine to become a UN member state and put it back in the Security Council. Then in Bahrain, the Arab League met uh, and uh, of course uh, called for uh, the two-state solution now to be implemented and called for an international conference. The King of Bahrain went uh, first to meet with President Putin, then he went to China to meet with President Xi Jinping. I think diplomacy is moving very fast. Of course, Israel's dead set against it. The United States is dead set with Israel, but the rest of the world is coming to understand the reality. And I don't think the U.S. and Israel alone can block the world will. Right. I mean, the U.S. is now bearing the brunt of global criticism for crushing its own red lines and international norms that it pushed others to adopt because of its unambiguous Uh, an ardent support for Israel. Now, why is the U.S. doing this? And is the shunning of the U.S. because of its support for Israel bad for its own security and its own national interests? Well, first of all, yes, uh, it is bad for the United States to be isolated. The U.S. Uh, as an imperial power has always been a hypocrite. Uh, don't uh, do what we do, do what we say. And uh, this is uh, standard for Uh, empires. Uh, think about the British mm -hmm. Empire, certainly one of the most hypocritical uh, empires in history. So the U.S. has acted with impunity, but it doesn't get away with it anymore because it's not alone. It's not as powerful as it thinks. Suddenly it's seeing uh, that China, Russia, uh, Brazil, uh, India, Africa, uh, all parts of the world are saying, no, you can't behave that way. Uh, and the U.S. is taking note of the fact that it's increasingly isolated diplomatically. In the past, the U.S. was so powerful that whatever it said, everyone stood up and cheered. Uh, but now the boos are coming from all parts of the world. It's having uh, an impact, not immediately, but it is having its impact on the U.S. politics. It's not safe for the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, Professor, with the until recently massive Um, U.S. campus protests, we see that American public opinion is turning slowly against Israel's apartheid rule and its you know, shocking violence in Gaza. But we also see that the Israel lobby uh, in the U.S. is working feverishly uh, to keep the pro-Israel narrative on track in major U.S. media outlets and to hold back moves uh, towards a two-state solution. Does such interference in U.S. decision-making processes have its limits? It does have its limits, uh, especially with people under the age of 35. Right. They're just not buying it. Uh, they're not watching the mainstream media. They're not reading the mainstream media. They're watching TikTok. They see what they see. Uh, by the way, that's why uh, the U.S. government's intent on forcing TikTok to close down. Right. Because uh, they, people see uh, something different from the official narrative. But so, yeah, I think that has nothing to do with China, has it? I, I think it has more to do with the, the Middle East, actually, in, okay. in the case of TikTok. It's, it's a combination of both. But we had senators saying very explicitly 
oh, we don't uh, like what TikTok is showing about Gaza. You know, they were not even uh, trying to hide that fact. So, yes, the U.S. narrative doesn't work. Uh, I don't think Biden is going to be reelected uh, personally, but that's just a guess. Uh, but I do know that uh, a large part of the American electorate is against uh, what the U.S. government's doing. Mm -hmm. But so you say that um, the U.S. is more than a protector of Israel. It is now an accomplice uh, in its genocidal attack against the Palestinians in Gaza. Pretty st strong words, Professor. Well, but that's literally the case. The, the U.S. is providing not only the munitions and the financing, it's providing the intelligence operations also. So the U.S. is a part of this war of Israel. It's, it's an ally to Israel. This is clear. Uh, they would probably say so themselves. But if we really saw the day-to-day -day coordination of intelligence operations, uh, munition shipments, financing, uh, political uh, consolidation, uh, geopolitical uh, operations in the UN and elsewhere, of course the U.S. is complicit. It's tragic. Uh, this uh, massacre should not uh, go on another moment, and the United States should not be a party to it. Right, but the U.S. has numerous allies in the Middle East. Why does Israel stand out? Why is this such an ironclad friendship? Well, it, it is a, a question, because uh, up until now, uh, it, it could work that way. Uh, uh, many uh, in the U.S. military-industrial complex see uh, Israel as is just a core to the U.S. security operations. Uh, the power of the Israel lobby is obviously very, very large. But it is also a bit of a mystery. It's not in America's interests. Uh, to uh, be complicit uh, in these war crimes. Uh, it, and it's isolating America uh, geopolitically in a, in a very uh, uh, adverse way for U.S. interests. Mm -hmm. And um, one more question on the region before we move towards uh, Asia. Um, you have earlier asserted that Israel will fail in its goals to militarily defeat Hamas. I've come across similar um, statements coming from Professor uh, Robert uh, Pape, who, who wrote a book on the, the strategic logic of suicide bombers. Why do you think so? Well, I, I think uh, Hamas is uh, just uh, so much part of uh, the Gazan community. And from reports uh, that we hear, uh, the support has strengthened this because uh, uh, Israel's massacring people and, and Hamas uh, is uh, seen as uh, a resistance force. I don't know whether that's true. I'm not on the ground, but uh, you can't really defeat uh, this resistance and this idea when Israel behaves uh, so uh, absolutely uh, uh, horrifically. And a, a huge part of the issue for Israel is it's not saying, well, you know, we get rid of Hamas and then uh, the two-state solution. It's saying, no, 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 we get rid of Hamas and then uh, Israel will rule over uh, the greater Israel. And so what Israel has put on offer, quote unquote, uh, is uh, just uh, endless apartheid and ethnic cleansing. Uh, it's uh, really made no bones about it, uh, this government. So how could uh, uh, the Palestinians ever uh, support that? How could you wipe out opposition when the avowed goal of Israel is not Israel's security, but Israel's domination over the Palestinian people? Mm -hmm. and over the land of Palestine, most importantly. Right. Um, I mean, well, I shouldn't say most importantly. Most importantly, from Israel's point of view, it just wants control over all of it. That's the mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, Professor, what are the geopolitical implications of the United States being bogged down militarily in supporting Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan in their respective military um, efforts? And why is it, uh, and do you perceive China as a military threat to the U.S. in the Asia-Pacific region? Well, the implications are we're uh, slipping towards a World War III. That's the real implication, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the U.S. cannot do what it uh, uh, says. Uh, it cannot uh, keep uh, Ukraine safe and expand NATO uh, to Ukraine. It cannot keep Israel safe. It can't uh, win a war uh, in uh, the South China Sea uh, over Taiwan, uh, it's overstretched, uh, overextended uh, politically. It's got the wrong idea anyway, uh, which is uh, 
hegemony in each of these areas. Uh, so the arrogance is also weighing heavily on the U.S., but uh, these uh, people in power in the United States only know one answer, which is, uh, well, if uh, we're uh, threatened because we are the sole superpower, we need to escalate. Uh, and the more the U.S. escalates, uh, the more dangerous it becomes because we're in a we're in an outright war with a, a nuclear superpower that has 6,000 nuclear weapons. This is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. But do you think that so, so uh, do you think that the entire pivot to Asia during the Obama, Obama administration was in a way senseless? Well, I don't think there really was a pivot to Asia. The United States aims to have primacy in every region of the world. This is not a goal I like, I even understand what they're talking about, really. But uh, they're hungry for dominance, and this is what's getting the United States into trouble in Europe, in the Middle East, and in Asia, all simultaneously. Because uh, maybe uh, these officials have not recognized the world's really changed. Uh, Russia can stand up to the United States. Uh, China can stand up to the United States. Russia and China uh, are uh, have become closer and closer because both of them have been pushed by the United States. Uh, Russia just signed a uh, security alliance with North Korea. I mean, the, the U.S. is pushing countries together because the U.S. has so many enemies on its list, uh, Russia, Iran, uh, China, uh, and so forth, uh, that it uh, pushes these countries uh, into, uh, in, into closer and closer relations. And the world really is different from what the American policymakers think. They think they run the world, but they don't run the world. Right. Uh, Professor, um, we know the, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is now entering third year. We know that there were a big, large debates in the Congress earlier this year on whether, whether to send a new aid package, a military aid package to, to the Ukrainians. Uh, you were one of those early intellectuals uh, who was, uh, wh whose comments uh, regarding the Russia's invasion of Ukraine were quite restrained from the very beginning. You weren't really a fervent supporter of, of Kiev. Um, uh, could you talk us, uh, what is your position today? Could you talk us through? Well, just to be precise, I was a fervent supporter of Kiev, but in a different way. Right. I said right. to the U.S. government, stop NATO enlargement, negotiate with Russia, mm -hmm. avoid a war. Mm -hmm. That was my point. Uh, but uh, these uh, people in Washington were, were really incompetent, in my view. Uh, either uh, they thought, oh, we won't have a war, which was very naive because they were crossing all of Russia's red lines, or they thought, well, we'll just defeat Russia, which is also uh, an incompetent point of view. So I don't know what they really felt, but I do know that this war could have been avoided. This war could have been ended in March 2022 on the basis of Ukraine's neutrality. The United States has continued to insist that everything must be done the U.S. way, and that's why Ukraine is uh, absolutely getting pummeled right now on the battlefield. Uh, this war has been caused fundamentally by uh, the U.S. trying to assert control in one way or another over the politics of Ukraine, whether through the coup in 2014 in February that overthrew Yanukovych, or by pushing uh, NATO into Ukraine. And this is just a Russian red line for uh, Russia, which has a 2,100 kilometer border with Ukraine. Right. But do you think there is um, some sort of fatigue among circles, in, in, among decision makers in Washington when it comes to supporting Ukraine? I mean, if Trump comes to the White House in November this year, um, uh, will things change? Things could change. Uh, Trump has said in recent days, well, yes, NATO, this is a problem. Uh, it, you know, he said, I've been told that NATO enlargement uh, has really provoked this. So he's uh, said <laughs> some of those things uh, that suggest that things really could change. Uh, there's fatigue among the American people, uh, but uh, among uh, this very small class of deciders, uh, you know, the president, right. uh, the national security advisor, the uh, secretary of state, the uh, Pentagon. I don't know if there's fatigue, uh, but they are fighting to the last Ukrainian. Uh, the Ukrainians are being dragged off the streets. The jails are being emptied. People are being sent to the front lines to die. 
So they're running out of Ukrainians. Now, the U.S. keeps escalating uh, the use of its missiles, its attackums. Oh, yes, you can, uh, uh, you can hit inside Russia and so forth. It's all very dangerous. But the fact of the matter is Ukraine is uh, just running out of people because they're dying. Right. But do you see Kiev uh, inadvertently dragging U.S. and NATO into, the, into its war with Russia? Well, I think uh, the U.S. dragged Ukraine into its okay. war with okay. Russia is, is the right way to put it. Mm -hmm. The U.S. said to NATO, we've got your back. Uh, you'll be part of NATO. <laughs> and uh, I told the Ukrainians, don't be so naive. You're going to end up like Afghanistan. Uh, sadly, I was right. Mm -hmm. um, Professor, finally, um, you know, do you see... Um you know, we talked, you have written earlier about the various large countries having their own spheres of influence. Do you see China and Russia as having the right to declare certain areas as their specific spheres of, spheres of influence? I mean, do you think it's okay for China to say, hey, you know, the South China Sea is our relig legitimate sphere of influence and a U.S. Coast Guard vessel has no business here whatsoever? Well, not quite, but I do believe that... Uh, uh, Russia has its right to say, uh, no, NATO, you're not going to be on our border. Uh, you don't put missiles anywhere you want. I think uh, great powers need to have prudence. They need to stay away from each other's red lines. You know, these are very powerful countries. These are nuclear superpowers. They don't need to be right up against each other, uh, taunting each other, testing each other. This is reckless. And the United States doesn't need to have the idea that it runs the world. That's extremely dangerous. The U.S. is 4.1% of the world population. Uh, it should give heed to the other 95.9% .9 of the world population. It should stop, like Biden always says, uh, oh, we're the most powerful country in the history of the world. Well, calm down, Mr. President. We don't have to assert our power everywhere. We don't have to say we send our... Uh, weapons to Taiwan, whether China likes it or not. The idea of being a superpower is to have prudence, uh, to stay away from the dangers that could tip us into nuclear Armageddon. And our leaders don't have that common sense right now, I'm afraid. So this is why it's dangerous. They need to understand some reality, uh, that there's a whole world out there and the United States should not be provoking other superpowers because we claim the right to do this. And by the way, I do not think that Mexico has the right to have Chinese and Russian military bases on our border. This is just not a right. I don't know where this idea of a right came from. Countries need to have prudence. I'd like to see all the overseas military bases go home, frankly, because then the world would be a lot safer. Mm -hmm. But do you think smaller countries like regional powers such as Turkey, uh, though they are member states of NATO, should have the right to, uh, to a balancing act between Russia, Ukraine, Iran, Iraq, and the U.S.? Well, countries have the right not to be invaded or overthrown by other countries. Mm -hmm. That's certainly true. But does that mean that uh, Ukraine, quote, has the right to have uh, U.S. military bases on its border with Russia? Not in my view. Uh, but anyway, whatever Ukraine says, the United States if it had any sense at all, would say, no, thank you. <laughs> we don't want World War III. Right. Professor Sachs, it was such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much once again for your time. Thank, thank you. Good to be with you. Appreciate it.